And now it's time for us to discuss more of these headlines and simple keywords. Adam joining us via Zoom. Good morning, Adam. Good morning, Lida. Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday to you too. Is this week going by fast? Uh, it's going by. All right, all right. Usual, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not fast, not not slow, just yeah. <laughs> All right, the same old usual. Let's jump into our keyword news portion of the day. We're going to try to clarify the major headlines for our listeners, starting with our first pick of the day. Korea Cuba ties. So, in a surprise announcement, South Korea has established diplomatic relations with Cuba, which has long been a friend of North Korea. It certainly sounds strategic, and that's the 193rd country South Korea formed relations with, only leaving Syria in the dark. What's the latest on it? Yeah, so Seoul's foreign ministry says the country's mission to the UN reached an agreement with representatives from Cuba uh, on Wednesday. Seoul and Havana first established diplomatic ties in 1949, but bilateral exchanges stopped following the 1959 Cuban Revolution. Uh, Cuba then turned towards fellow communist nation North Korea. And in 2016, the South Korean foreign minister at that time actually visited Cuba and expressed a desire to form diplomatic ties. And in June last year, President Yoon's government offered humanitarian aid to Cuba, uh, Cuba which uh, suffered severe damage from heavy rain, mm -hmm. in fact. So this kind of project to develop diplomatic ties with Cuba has actually been in the works for quite some time now. Um, so uh, now it has uh, officially developed uh, diplomatic relations with uh, the country. Now, while Cuba and South Korea have not had diplomatic relations for decades, um, they have in recent years forged important commercial ties. There's been a lot of exports and imports happening and trade between the two countries. Now, they reportedly negotiated for diplomatic ties behind the scenes, taking into consideration that North Korea might, of course, oppose the move and attempt to block or sabotage uh, it. Now, the two countries plan to actively discuss follow-up measures, such as establishing mutual embassies. Uh, it added that Seoul will develop foundations for expanding economic cooperation and helping firms start business in Cuba. Now, uh, once an adversary, the U.S. Uh, State Department said it respects South Korea's sovereign right to determine the nature of its diplomatic relations kind of um not very welcoming but mm. uh not very uh, not expressing too much of a concern either just saying that it respects the decision but of course the u.s and cuba of course have some history uh but uh yeah it seems like uh, for south korea anyway it's just another uh latest in a series of countries where it's developing uh re diplomatic relations of which there are many mm -mm. We'll leave it there for now so we can move on to our second keyword of the day. Trip to Europe delayed. So there are a lot of moving parts to establish these trips. So why would the president be inclined to delay his planned trip to Germany and Denmark? This is just days before his scheduled departure. So let's try to take a look at the reasons being cited. Right, so Hughes' office said the decision came after considering various issues and consulting both countries without really elaborating on any further details. So we don't really know the exact reason why, officially anyway. Now, initially, Yoon was scheduled to visit Germany and Denmark for a week from the 18th in a state and official visit format, respectively. Uh, the visit was not cancelled, of course, however, and is expected to take place at a later date, uh, just not when it was initially scheduled for. Now, no decision has been made on when the visits will be rescheduled. Now, this is the first time, in fact, that Yoon has postponed or cancelled an overseas visit expected to take place in just several days. Uh, so it's a bit unprecedented and it is uh, sparking a lot of questions surrounding it. Uh, reports citing a ruling party source suggest the decision was made to focus on domestic issues such as the economy, people's livelihoods and security, of course, in light of increased provocations from North Korea as well as other livelihood issues as well. Um, New Strip was intended to focus on economic activities with an economic delegation also organized to accompany him. Now, some in the political sphere interpret that a political judgment was also made considering the general elections in April are just two months away. Mm. Uh, there were concerns that the opposition might politicize the trip's costs and use it as a material for attack 
so the decision was made not to give them any, uh, you know, pretext. Uh, so uh, there are questions of surrounding, uh, is it a political decision? Is Yoon going to stay in the country to bolster the ruling party's chances mm -hmm. of winning in the general elections? Um, those are just some of the questions that are uh, coming up at the moment. But of course, uh, nothing official at the moment. But uh, yes, mm -hmm. they will be rescheduled. We just don't know when. Or it could be both. I mean, of course, giving less political ammunition for the opposing opposition is not such a bad mm. uh, stance to take just two months away from the general election. But it, it is a timely topic to talk about increased North Korean provocations and people's livelihood. I don't think we ever bounce back from the worst of the pandemic. That's right. It's still reading from it. And uh, yeah, but it's interesting that this uh, decision came literally just days before mm. you're scheduled to depart. So mm. again, uh, speculating, but uh, is there some issues going on mm. within the Green administration or the ruling party for that matter? Uh, we'll have to see. All right, let's move on to our third keyword of the day. Cruise missiles. So North Korea has again fired several cruise missiles off its east coast. We're beginning to sound like a broken record. This is the fifth barrage of cruise missiles in the past month alone. It was expected, maybe not so frequently, but we knew provocations would come along leading up to important elections throughout this year. So what's the latest, Adam? Yeah, so there's been this trend uh, in North Korea uh, when it comes to cruise missile provocation okay. specifically. I mean, because they're not officially or technically violations of UN Security uh, Council resolutions compared to ballistic missile launches, for example, the North does tend to uh, add the frequency of the provocations when it comes to uh, such weapons testing. Now, uh, it seems like this time round is no different. Uh, Seoul's military detected the launch of an unspecified number of cruise missiles from the waters northeast of Wonsan in Kangwon province around 9 a.m. Uh, the South Korean and U.S. intelligence agencies are currently conducting a detailed analysis. Now, the military has strengthened surveillance and vigilance and is closely coordinating with the U.S. while closely monitoring for uh, any additional signs and activities from North Korea. So basically the same response that comes out mm. every time uh, such provocations come out. Now, the latest launch comes nearly two weeks after the last launch on February 2nd. It also came just two days, in fact, before the birthday of Kim Jong-un, which is often marked by provocations. Uh, a military source speculated that North Korea's frequent uh, cruise missile launches this year aim to ensure the missile system stability and improve strike accuracy. The loss is touted what it's calling um, a major development in its uh, Hwasa uh, 331, I think it was the name, of its new um, cruise missiles. Now, after achieving a range of up to 2,000 kilometers with the launch of Hwasa 2 at the end of last month, it suggested that Pyongyang aims to more uh, to more stably establish the system. Now, watchers also suggest that the North missile tests are not merely tests, but are intended as what they're or some suggesting is a, a showcase with sales to Russia in mind. Mm. And that's how also North Korea generates profits, right? Much needed, uh, well, money for coming into their flow. Purasai, right? Yeah. Purasai 331. Oh, sorry, Purasai, yes. Right, right. Uh, that was the old name. Excuse me. Thank you for that. All right, let's move on to our fourth keyword of the day. Into Korean gambling ring. So South Korea's National Intelligence Service says a North Korean IT group operating overseas has created thousands of illegal gambling sites in China, sold them to South Korean criminal organizations to generate profits. We always knew Kim Jong-un had many means of adding to his slush funds. This is one more feather in his hat. Tell us the details. Yeah, so what, what other one, uh, ways of uh, getting money into North uh, Korea is through hacking, uh, stealing uh, funds and uh, cryptocurrencies and illegal gambling sites as well. It's uh, becoming a social issue in South Korea as well. Uh, and the root of them seems to be from these North Korean uh, hack or IT groups. Now, the NIS said the group is... Uh, Kyongong Information Technology Exchange Company based in Tandong, China. It is an organization under the so-called Bureau 39 or Office 39 of the Workers' Party of Korea. It's tasked with procuring and managing personal, uh, personal slush funds for 
for uh, Kim Jong-un. Now, the NIS said 15 members of the organization have produced gambling websites using a systematic division of labor. Now, each worker at the company earned $500 a month, which they remitted to the North. Uh, the company sold the illegal gambling websites for uh, $5,000 each and mm. took another $3,000 to maintain them. The South Korean clients reportedly resold the gambling websites to third uh, parties, raking in several trillion won in profit, uh, profits. Now, they also purchased domestic servers for the North Korean IT workers as well, apparently. This provided a route through which the North Korean engineers could hack into some Korean companies, stealing information, including the identification information of uh, more than 1,100 South Koreans. Now, the group's activities violate U.S. Security Council resolutions that were passed in December 2017, which bans North Korean nationals from working um, overseas. Of course, that was aimed to block um, funds going into North Korea to fund uh, the regime's weapons developments or programs. Now, the NIS says this is the first time concrete evidence has actually been revealed to the public showing North Korea's deep involvement in cyber uh, gambling crimes, which have become, of course, as I mentioned, a serious social issue uh, here in South Korea. All right, with that, we move on to our final keyword of the day. KDI Growth Outlook. So the state-run think tank has maintained its forecast for Korea's economic growth rate at 2.2% for this year, but it slightly revised down the inflation outlook. Can you tell us the details of the report? Sure. So the KDI's prediction is unchanged from its November forecast. It anticipates growth rates of 2.3% in the first half of the year and 2% in the second half. This annual growth forecast aligns with the government and the OECD, but very slightly from the Bank of Korea's 2.1% and the IMF's 2.3%. Now, exports are predicted to recover, particularly in semiconductors, but the outlook for domestic consumption uh, does remain weak, according to the KDR. It has increased its export growth forecast from 3.8% to 47 and adjusted the current account surplus forecast to $56.2 billion, up by uh, about $13.5 billion. Now, however, the Institute sees deepening domestic demand weakness, adjusting the private consumption growth forecast down from 1.7% uh, from 1.8, with a more significant impact expected on goods uh, consumption due to interest rates. Basically, mm. people are buying less because, of course, interest rates are high, especially when it comes to, you know, things where a lot of loans are taken out or mortgages. So real estate, uh, for one. Now, the consumer price index is expected to rise by 2.5% this year, a slight decrease from the previous forecast, with inflation expected to slow down due to domestic uh, demand weakness. Now, external risks uh, they cited include geopolitical tensions in the Middle East and the possibility of a rapid downturn uh, in China's economy, particularly in the real estate sector over there. Uh, the KDI warns that if China's economic slowdown is more severe than expected, South mm. Korea's growth rate could drop to around 2%. Uh, it doesn't think that the upcoming elections in Korea and in the US will have a big immediate impact on the economy, but they could pose challenges, of course, um, in the long term. So that depends on not really much who, who um, is elected into office here in Korea, but I think more uh, hangs in the balance with the presidential election in the U.S. is mm. if Donald Trump is re-elected mm. uh, to the White House. Of course, that will have more, of course, long-term economic effects for Korea because, of course, uh, Donald Trump being a well-known uh, protectionist uh, of uh, the American uh, economy. Mm. We'll have to see if any of his policies that he tried to push through when he was president last time round mm. uh, will be uh, continued if he is re-elected uh, comes into play as well. All right, we'll leave it there for now. Adam, thank you so much for today's discussion. We'll speak to you again tomorrow. You're very welcome. See you tomorrow. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.